Hello everyone, I'm Julie Wiskirken from the Authors Program at Google, and today I am really excited to welcome Cloris Leachman to talk about her new autobiography. Um, Cloris has appeared in 11 Broadway plays, 57 films, and 137 television shows. Just let that sink in for a minute. <laughs> she won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for her devastating performance in The Last Picture Show. She has won eight primetime Emmys, which is more than any other actress. Actor. Her, actor. Anyone. Her credits include Young Frankenstein, High Anxiety, History of the World Part One, Mary Tyler Moore Show, and her spinoff Phyllis, Malcolm in the Middle, and most recently she dazzled us on Dancing with the Stars. And today she'll be discussing her autobiography in conversation with her son, George Englin. So please join me in welcoming Cloris and George. I have to say it's George England Jr. <laughs> because obviously <coughs> there's the bigger one around. Yeah, the bigger one, the the over the Uberstrasser. Uh, who that means the over book street, with George. I know it's a not the right terminology, but he's my father. Uber dad. Monger. Yeah. So, Taurus. So, you've been called many things. Oh God. But many good things, a brilliant comedian, a genius. But uh, one of the things that comes up a lot is that you're unpredictable. How? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to know what happens in your mind when you walk into a room or you ha receive a role or a part that you have to read for, or perform, make up a character. What goes through your mind at that point? Because it seems to be. When is familiar. lunch? <laughs> <laughs> or dinner, depending. I just wait for the right time and then wonder um, what goes through my mind. Yeah, you don't seem to approach things with an expected reaction. You have a completely different tack from Well, I, mo I think mostly open. <clears throat> I'm open to whatever it's going to be. So you've just finished the book and we've been on a whirlwind tour oh. all around the world, starting in New York for the book. Is it exciting for you? Oh, I'm having the most amazing, um, every day some amazing things happen that you had not expected. And it's always better than it was planned, always. It just opens up and, and surprises you. I'm going to go kind of nonlinear here. That's good, George. Yeah. <laughs> now, you mentioned you like lunch and dinner, good food. I know that to be true. Well, I like that sort of as a reward for everything I'm doing. Absolutely. I'm still picking my teeth from lunch. It's very good. Thank you. <laughs> she, sells, she says that she will go anywhere where they feed her. So here we are at Google. <laughs> very Have good. Have you ever Googled before? I don't. If I push the uh, Google button. No, the, the machine, the internet. Internet. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even know what to push or what to, or what to do with it if it said something. You don't have a Google logo in here. But uh, all right, we'll get back to Google. But lunch, what about lunch? Well, lunch, I had lunch. <laughs> and that was a line in, a, in a, a play I did in New York with Jackie Cooper. Uh, I was Dunreath McHenry. And I had two colors in my eyes, one blue and one brown. And um, I was going to tell you something about it. Lunch. Oh. There's a little boy there with a big uh, sheepdog. <coughs> and we invite him <coughs> to have lunch. And he said he has to call his mother. So he picks up the phone. We're all waiting. All of us grown-ups are waiting. And he picks up this big phone and dials probably this way in those days. <coughs> We're all waiting. The audience all. Hello, Mom. Uh, they asked me if I could stay for lunch. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, I had lunch. He says to us. <laughs> <laughs> it got a huge laugh from the audience. 
You love <coughs> animals, but I've noticed in particular dogs. You love dogs. Well, I see them more often. Yeah. My, look at that. <laughs> I love other things, too. But when you see a dog, you stop and... Well, he stops, too. What if he's a girl? She stops, too. And even more important, babies. If you see a baby, what oh. happens up here? What? Oh, I just love the baby. <laughs> and I have to make the baby love me back. <laughs> Cookie dookie dookie goo 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 and when I let her play with my beads and the mother and father say, oh, don't, don't break the beads. Don't worry. I'm in charge we here. Were, we were just in Peru uh, walking around, and I have a series of pictures. There's a baby buggy there, and she's looking out at the coastline. And then I went click, click, click. She goes around like this and disappears into the baby carriage like this. <laughs> and all you see is the rear end of her sticking out <laughs> and the parents going. <laughs> And uh, she came out about an hour later. <laughs> the baby loved me then. And absolutely. I must say it's reciprocal. Uh, also, you don't have fear. I've noticed that also. I'm no afraid fear. of the boogeyman. They're going to get me every night. <clears throat> well, Dancing with the Stars, for instance, you walk out, there's 25 million people watching. 30. 30. <laughs> uh, most people would freeze, but you're very at home in that atmosphere. And suddenly your leg goes flying up. <laughs> well, Corky just pulled it up and there it was, you know. I was as surprised as he was. But on the judge's uh, table. No, they just, oh, that. I don't know what happened. My, it, it looked like a big space and, and my leg just went up to sort of do something with it. <clears throat> I had nothing to do with my leg. I didn't, I didn't even think about it. <clears throat> uh, What's the difference for you between theater, film, and television, if any, when you go to? Oh, well, you, what it used do you to prefer? be that you had to speak a lot louder on stage. What? It used to be <laughs> that you had to speak a lot louder on the stage. I couldn't do anything in high school because they couldn't hear me over the stage. But I learned to speak louder calling cabs in New York. That's it! <laughs> Every night, I was, had a part on Broadway, and I was on East 68th Street, Madison and 68th Street. And to get through town oh, takes so long. And so I'd run out, I was already late, of my apartment. I'd stand on Madison and 68th Street on the northeast corner looking for a cab. And there was a woman, a woman there, tall, about six feet tall, in high heels, a black dress, that she'd pick up like this all the time and run in her high heels. And I'd look for buses and I'd look for cabs. And finally, I'd see a cab three blocks down. I'd say, taxi! <laughs> and it would stop and back up. She'd pick up her legs, her, her dress, and start running in her high heels and always get the cab. So that was what I did every night. So that's the theater experience. That's how I learned how to, to be heard. I think it worked. It did. So in television, how is that different from being on stage? Do you like television or movies or the more intimate experience of the audience? I the love theater? stage. I love, I love it. It's wonderful, thrilling, more, more immediate. But now I have the audience inside me. I know, I know how they're going to react pretty much. So it helps a lot with timing and uh, voicing and everything. Uh, you have met a number of presidents and or their wives. Yes. The Kennedys, for instance. You didn't meet JFK, but when you first met Jackie, what was that like? Oh, How did sure. that happen? <laughs> um, I was invited by Sergeant Shriver, who's married to Eunice Kennedy, uh, Jack's <coughs> sister, to go to the compound over the 4th of July weekend. This was many years. This was 1964, a year after Kennedy was shot and killed. And I had just done something with Peter Falk in New York, and my mother was taking care of the kids back home. So I said, yes, I'd love to come up for the weekend. And he said, well, we'll send the Caroline for you, the little airplane. And then he called back and said, would you mind going to Washington? We'll, we'll land there and pick you up. And No, that'll be fine. I, so I got up early, 6.30, flew to Washington waited for the little plane, there it came, and landed, and everybody was on board, all the children and their keepers. 
and little animals and things. And I got on, and, and we took off, and I immediately got plane sick. Whoa. And I threw up all over the Caroline. It was just horribly embarrassing. <laughs> oh. And then I remember talking about, I was a vegetarian then, and I talking about how we steam things and little good things to eat and everything. Well, somehow or other, that fed back to the cooks there in the compound who brought it out that night. So overcooked, it was brown. It was just inedible. And he had gotten clams and wonderful. Well, I don't eat clams. I'm from Iowa, and we don't have clams there, and we didn't eat clams. And so trying to get through dinner was interesting. And then we, everybody gave presents to Joe Kennedy when we got there, things they'd drawn in a little gift, and he had had his stroke. And everybody was fawning all over him, and finally uh, uh, we left to do something else. And I noticed he was tired and kind of, kind of irritable. <coughs> And I said later to somebody, I think we stayed too long with him. I think he was getting irritated. That wasn't the right thing to say then. Everything I did was wrong, everything. Uh, then we had lunch, I think, at Ethel Kennedy's house. And uh, in walks Jackie, all dressed to kill. I had an old 10-year-old moo from Hawaii. I mean, I wouldn't even have worn it, uh, ever. Well, I had it on. And my hair had been black and white and silver and red, and now it was just all falling out practically from being on shows that I'd make myself look different in my hair, different color. So I had a big scarf that had nothing to do with the moo, -moo. <laughs> oh, And uh, I looked horrible, horrible. <laughs> and here's Jackie Kennedy looking gorgeous. And uh, this was shortly after, a year later, when Jackie Kennedy had not been seen after he was killed. And I was supposed to meet my husband uh, one night. He was flying in from New York. And I hadn't heard from him, so I called the plaza where he had been staying. Well, he's checked out. Oh, well, then he'll be home. So I waited and waited and didn't hear. Finally, I called the airport. What's the latest, the last plane's coming in? Three o'clock. OK. Well, I waited and didn't hear. So I got in bed, turned on the television, said, tonight in Washington, Jackie Kennedy and her sister, Lee Radziwill, had dinner with Marlon Brando and George England. Thank you and good night. I turned off the TV and went to sleep. I've never heard about that night, except the other night we were talking about my book to a lot of people, and the question came up, so what really happened? So we called my former husband. And <laughs> we had a wonderful conversation. I never did find out. But he told us interesting things, didn't he? Yeah. What did he say? He talked about uh, when Kennedy was killed that Jackie had gone to Dallas and she was very... Uh, she was worried she about was going there in the first place. Event. And that there was one cop in particular, it was a redneck kind of cop that she couldn't relate to. And uh, he told it in a fascinating way. But basically, this cop came out and told her that Kennedy had been shot, and he was crying at that time, and she was just They were at the hospital. She was down. waiting by herself. Nobody was helping. Just They wouldn't let her in there. And <clears throat> he came out and put his arms around her and held her and made her feel human, you know. Suddenly, this redneck cop turned into the most wonderful human being, maybe the only one who really was, was loving and helpful to her. Uh, Reagan. What? Nancy Reagan. <laughs> I'm very bad to talk to about her because I never liked her. <laughs> no, I mean, if you, if you think past saying that, you look behind who anybody is, and there's always, there are always reasons and lots of material to pull from, and you change your mind pretty, pretty quickly. But I sort of enjoy not liking her. Well, I think she's a pill. <laughs> now, there are different kinds of pills. She's the kind that it's a, has an aftertaste of oh, water quick. <laughs> um, no, she, does, she doesn't look like any fun, does she? But when you ran into her in the market. <laughs> At the Brentwood Country Mart, I was in the, <laughs> in the canned food section. And right around the canned tomatoes, here comes Nancy Reagan. He had just been governor of California. And I said, oh, hi, Nancy. She said, oh, hi, Cloris. And uh, 
I, I had to disguise how I really feel about her. And I was so frightened that she would see me, how I really felt that I, I said, well, what do you think? You know, meaning nothing. I had nothing in my mind. <laughs> And, and she said, also covering her feelings about me, I'm sure, she said, <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> and she, and that was it. So then I went <laughs> on Johnny Carson a few weeks later, and I said, well, I'm the first one to find out that uh, jo um, Ronald Reagan is running for president. <laughs> really? <laughs> Out of saying nothing, we said all of that, and so. But you I, didn't actually know that he was. Well, I didn't running. know at all. But so <laughs> you just guessed right. No, I think he did start running, and then I was able to say I was the first one to know about it, in the canned food section behind the tomato cans. <laughs> and when uh, Bill Clinton was running for president, <laughs> you saw him on television. Well, didn't he look terrible at one point? He got so distorted and unhealthy looking, really bad and dangerous. I thought. So I dangerous. It's dangerous to be in that condition. <clears throat> so I called Hillary and I talked to her secretary for 45 minutes. And we had a lovely conversation. Then I hung up and did everything I was doing. Two days later, Hillary calls me. I couldn't remember why I'd called her. What the hell? What the Sam Hill? And she could, had an agenda, too, I think. So we had a lovely conversation. But I did say, I want to come to the White House with a bag over my head. <clears throat> Nobody will ever know me or see me. I'll go into the kitchen quietly, cook some wonderful food for Bill, and uh, he'll help him slim down, and, and it's delicious, and I can teach them a few little things, and uh, then I'll get my bag and, and go on. <laughs> and I don't, think, I don't think we talked more than that after I said what I wanted. But um, she was very nice to me, very, very lovely. I was proud that she did that. Uh, after you saw Marlon, or the, the, on TV, that Marlon and Dad were in Washington, D.C., right? What was it like when you first met Marlon in the actor's studio and that experience, and how did it go from there? You met Marlon for the first time. Well, uh, we had a dance class connected with the actor's studio once a week, and the woman who ran it uh, did a wonderful thing. <coughs> I think it was called Razzle Dazzle, written by somebody. And part of it was an apache. And she asked me and Warren Stevens, another man in the actor studio, to do it. And it was wonderful. We were just, the, you couldn't be better than we were. Excellent. It was, it's a real sexy, controlled dance. And then she invited the other class to come in, including Marlon Brando. And they all came and watched, and we did it. And then Marlon asked me out two or three times, and I said no. Stupid me. <laughs> no, I thought he'd just break my heart. I'm sure he would have, and I'm not his type anyway, which I knew. And that's enough of that. OK. Uh, let's talk about some of your characters that you created, a memorable Frau Blucher. <laughs> <laughs> Mel told me a few years ago that Blucher meant glue. <laughs> The horses were afraid of glue. <laughs> what do you want to know, George? I want to know how you created Frau Blucher, how that character evolved, emerged. Well, Mary, the famous the head hairdresser of 20th, did my hair in a knot just quickly and did it. And it was wonderful. It has a little individual twist. Didn't you think it was mm -hmm. good? And uh, then uh, the costume fit me perfectly. It was just wonderful, perfect. And then I had makeup put on, and that was good. And then I went to the set. They were shooting, and I had to shoot very shortly, and I didn't have an, a German accent. I'd never, never said one before. I didn't know how it, even how to think about it. I was asking everybody. I said, do you know, do you know a German accent? A German accent. I have to, do you know a German accent? Well, about three people seemed to maybe, maybe know. I think it was Mel Brooks' mother who helped me. Don't ask me why. <laughs> but uh, I just remember coming to the front door, and it goes, no, it goes, and I walk out and I say, I am Frau 
Luca. But I said it, if you'll notice, very in a very measured way. I was trying so hard to get it right that it had to be very slow. <laughs> and then it got quicker and more easily uh, said. So I got better as it wore on. Or wore out, either way. <laughs> or wore off. That film is such a classic. Working with Mel and Jean, and in particular the scene on the stairs where you're about to show him the castle. What happens? You're walking up the stairs, you're shooting Well, this. every time we did that scene, going up the stairs, from the first little group was going up, and I have this candelabra with the candles not lit, and I say, stay close to the candles. The staircase can be treacherous. <laughs> and he would, he would, his face would be in two pieces. Here's one part and here's the other part, separate. And I'd have to do it again, because he kept laughing. <laughs> and then Mel came up and gave me a line reading, so it's much better now. The only line reading he ever gave me in my life. And he came up and whispered in my ear, and now here it goes. Stay close to the candles. The staircase can be treacherous. <laughs> 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 Means we've lost a couple of people over the edge. <laughs> Nurse Diesel was a uh, bizarre character, for sure. Well, perhaps. And when you went into wardrobe for that and makeup, how did that happen? I went to uh, the costume department at 20th, and about five women came in, the designer and women to help, and uh, they put this dress perfectly fit me, except I looked like in an unborn gosling. I looked at myself in the mirror. And so I said, I think we need to balance it a little better. So, and I kept looking, finally I, I said, here, put something on my back, a little hump there, to balance these big pointed things. And so they did that, and it was good. I said, now I want my neck to be short. So, so can you put some? Well, they put it out here, and it didn't work. We took that out, and then they put it in right where I said. And it raised up my dress, and the tits went up at the same time. It was perfect. So we left that, too. And then I had a wig, a brown wig, which came down to here. And they piled it all and put a pin in. Because one of the scenes that was cut out was where I take one pin out and it falls down. <laughs> um, then I went to makeup and they put on my, the base. And then I did the rest. I did two little curly eyebrows, too close together and too low. Very unflattering. And then I put on a real thin mouth with a little brown line around it, thinner than my own lips. And then it got in my teeth, so I left it on. I decided I'd be a cheery nurse. You want to hear my nickname? We forgot to use it. It was Iron Pits. <laughs> uh, then I went to my dressing room, and I was sitting there waiting, all dressed, and I had a little black pencil. I kind of. And then knock, knock, knock. Chloris? Come on the set now. Oh, thank you. I ran out in the set, and Mel was there, and we talked. And I said, how do you want me to play this part? He said, well, we should. I said, well, I did that already. He said, when? I, uh, uh, Frau Blucher. Oh, he said, well, how do you want to do it? I said, I don't know. I just don't. I'm so evil in this, I don't want them to recognize me. And I think people would know me from my smile and my teeth. And he said, well, you want to be, what do you want to do? So I said, well, I want to cover up my teeth. So I ended up having to talk out of the corner of my mouth. Dr. Ashley felt that color has a great deal to do with the well-being of the emotionally disturbed. <laughs> and he said, you want to be that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I never answered him. We started rehearsing and shooting, and it went on from there the same way. And uh, I had to match my mustache in every scene, because <laughs> I'd already had it on. I didn't take it off. I forgot. And that's how. Speaking of crazy, Phyllis was crazy to a degree, and people ask if that's the way you are in real life. I would say no. Do you think so? No. No. <laughs> no. No, I think, though, that that character, the way she barges in the door I would say and it experience. Permeated stuff. Well, if I'd have an interview in my house, I remember Dinah going through with the dogs 
really barking. She was on roller skates and wee, and I didn't try to quiet her or change it. Uh, it was more Phyllis than not, I thought. But uh, the way you enter a situation or a room, you come in open, like you said, and I think Phyllis uh, was an example of how you really think and operate. That you, you don't have barriers. You just come in and and have a different experience, very different. Well, I'm not afraid to go in. Some people are. They really are. They suffer. <clears throat> so I luckily don't have that. I, I think I'm who I am or the way I am uh, for a couple of reasons. One is <clears throat> the beginnings of me. I, I never got criticized by my mother. She never said any bad words to me about me. And. Uh, I tell this little story about her that the only time, I think, I don't know what we'd done wrong, what it was, but Mama was sitting on the edge of the bathtub in the little bathroom and crying. And well, she didn't cry. I thought, what's the matter, Mama? What's the matter? She said, oh, I just thought I'd have three lovely little girls. and We just sew and cook, she said. Where have I gone wrong? <laughs> She didn't attach anything to us, so we felt terrible. <laughs> Another time I stayed out all night with a, a boy who, whose parents were gone, of course, for the evening. Uh, for, and he asked me to stay with so I, we stayed in his car, a little uh, open uh, a convertible with a rumble seat. I was in the rumble seat, and he was in the car with a top up. And everything up and I was in this just open damn rumble seat and the mosquitoes oh, were just horrible and I had horrible hay fever. It was the worst night of my life and I came running home and up the stairs and my parents were sitting there having breakfast and I got ready and went to the radio station where I had a radio show and I had to get there quickly. And Mama didn't ever get mad at me or anything. She just said, well, I thought you were smarter than that. Oh, you thought I was smart. Oh, isn't that one? I didn't know you thought I was smart. <laughs> well, that's what I got out of that. And, you know, it's better than punishing you. You never remember what you did that was wrong anyway. Just remember how cruel your parents are if they do spank you or punish you. Don't you think punishments are the worst? <sighs> to be grounded is so stupid. Or to take things away that are theirs. Who has a right to take something away? It's not really mine, it's yours and you can take it away whenever you want. Why? I mean, kids are going to do what kids do all their lives, forever and ever and ever. And they'll grow out of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I slapped Georgie one time. One time? <laughs> I never touched him except this one time, fully grown, sitting in the... In the New Year's Eve. No, it was in the morning, New Year's oh, Day, Georgie. Eve. That's where you were wrong. Okay. <laughs> he was sitting at the end of the table. We had a rectangle table in the kitchen. And I went over and just went, I just, just killed him. She roundhoused me. As, as hard as you can slap somebody, I did. Bam. And he was just, he said, why did you do this? I said, so you remember your New Year's resolution? <laughs> what was it? Not to drink anymore. <laughs> Speaking of that, you, when you were young, <laughs> it's your goal this year to... This is my year to be an alcoholic. <laughs> well, I've never been one, and I couldn't be one, so I decided to be one just for a year. So I have a Bloody Mary whenever possible with half the ice, half the spice, and half the liquor, but a tall glass. It's so delicious. It's not so mean and aggressive as a regular Bloody Mary. <laughs> then I have a margarita at night that isn't sweet, which means you can't put sweet and sour in it. What else? Fresh limes. You're going to have to ramp it up a little bit. With salt and rocks, you know. <laughs> now, and that's me <laughs> being an alcoholic for a year. <laughs> I think you're getting there. I'm trying. In, in matter of fact, is it, which one should I have now? <laughs> I think, well, keep going. <laughs> <laughs>
So when you were young, you were sent into town and <laughs> you discovered something about yourself. You didn't want to be a gray person. Oh. I think that really defined you to your way of thinking at that point in your life. How old were you? Seven. Seven. <laughs> no. I had to ride the streetcar for the first time in my life into Des Moines. And I was shocked, really, truly just shocked because everybody on it was gray, a gray person, I mean. Just, they were dead and dying. They were sleeping and dying. It was very, to see people in that shape was very scary and awful to me. And I made a decision that when I grew up, if I ever saw anybody smiling, I would give them a nickel. <laughs> that was a lot of money in those days. And, uh, or if any, I would never let anybody make me gray or grind me down into a gray person. It worked. It worked. You've remained ungray. <laughs> uh, Dancing with the Stars is something everybody everywhere asked about. What was it like? You know, we love you on Dancing with the Stars. What was it like? For they don't you? say we love you. They go, oh. We love you and dance with the star. I mean, it's sort of half terror and half, whoa, how are you doing? You know, I feel the same way. We see each other across the street, and I go like that and turn around, and we start laughing. I, don't, I didn't know what I was getting into when I started it. And it was a surprise all the way, but great, great fun, really fun. One of the, first, one of the only times that you felt fear oh. was on Dancing with well, the Stars. Well, Corky... Corky decided he should do a spin with me around going like that. And so he told me about it. I said, oh. And he needed this arm and this leg. And then you, you, you give it to him. Give him, <laughs> give them to him. And then he starts whirling you around. <laughs> and so I said, Corky, I'm going to do that. It's great. Not now. <laughs> and not until we do it. I'll do it once before. It's easy, I'll don't worry. And uh, we went on, and then the night that we did it, I don't know what happened, I guess we missed it. I handed in something wrong for it, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, uh, then he said, let's do it. So I handed him my arm and my leg, and somehow I was whirling around him at breakneck speed for two measures. And then it was time to end it. And I'm back up, but only for two measures. It should have been eight. So it was all right. And then uh, we got voted off that night. <laughs> then I, two days later, you be on the, you're on The View. And uh, they said we we're going to be doing our whatever dance we wanted to do. And we decided to do that dance where he whirls me around. And uh, so we did it. And he whirled me eight times, which is what you're supposed to. By the time I got up, I was, I was dead. <laughs> And there was heaven. <laughs> I had a shape, a line, but there was nothing in me. There was no brain or heart or bones or anything. Just a shape and heaven. I thought, isn't this nice? There's heaven. And I'm dead. <laughs> I was dead. It, they saw I was in trouble and gave me a chair. <laughs> it took me quite a while to come to. What do you want to do as a follow-up to Dancing with the Stars? What's your next? <laughs> Well, I thought about that, and I decided, well, I'll be on American Idol. <laughs> <laughs> then I was told, you, you have to be under 28 years old. So then Georgie suggested we hire Gloria Allred to sue them for discrimination. <laughs> She's working on it. Is she? <laughs> um, you have some interesting things in the works right now. Your website, chloris.com, and your new... Chloris line.com new clothing line shall we show the people yeah. come and see this is veronique my very favorite designer isn't she gorgeous and darling and beautiful model nancy and these are the clothes aren't they pretty and the hat and the jewelry and the the beads <laughs> i help them with their hair <laughs> So this is just, uh, you're just launching this now, your new clothing line. It's my brand new, just, just out. 
and that's on chlorusline.com. And what kind of clothes are they? They're chiffon. You can wear them to the beach in the morning. You could go move to the beach if you're not there. It, it <laughs> and look, looks like zebra. Yeah, it looks kind of like a zebra, but not boring. And this comes with it. Isn't that beautiful? You can tie it up for evening and put on the jewelry and wash your face, put on your hat. <laughs> Look, isn't that pretty? And it's for all size people, for teeny tiny or great big, for tall or short. And the chiffon, it feels wonderful. It's fun and light and what's the word? Uh, versatile. 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 And this thing, oh, you don't, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This comes <laughs> with it. <laughs> Here, this, no wait, this comes with it. <laughs> this comes with <laughs> How much is this whole thing? The whole How idea. much is this by itself? Everything on the website is under $50. It's, everything is under $50. Under $50. Isn't that pretty for under $50? And the pants? All right. And the All pants, pants too, you can buy the pants for $2. <laughs> <laughs> A little more than $2. <laughs> How much are the pants? They are. I don't remember, but it's somewhere around thirty dollars. That's too expensive. Is it? Has to be less than thirty. Twenty-nine dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, darling. So you just worked with Quentin Tarantino, and who did you not have a scene with? Brad Pitt. Oh. What was but it I, like working with Quentin, though? Quentin is a genius, a wonderful, sweet, odd man. He's odd looking. He's Kind of, it's kind of like a Picasso drawing where the nose and eye are here and then the nose and eye are here. <laughs> He's so sweet. And he and I met for the first time at a casting office, um, the casting woman for the show, right at the top of Hollywood, of, of Star, Sunset, I mean, Sunset Boulevard there. And uh, we met there and we were talking about two feet from each other and the earthquake hit. <laughs> so it seemed like it was ordained to be important. Something important was going to happen. Do you have any future uh, plans with Jack Black, having done The Office for him? <laughs> he turned out to be the sweetest man Jack Black did. Who would imagine that? I wouldn't. <laughs> I prejudged him. No, he's a dear, darling, sweet man, a wonderful kisser. <gasps> <laughs> well, we kissed in that two and a half. How, what Anybody was it? see The Office after the Super Bowl? Wasn't it cute, funny? I didn't get to see it, but we had a wonderful time doing it. And the funniest mm -hmm. thing about it, the other man on it turned out to be 19 years old. And in order to make Jack Black jealous, I have a little scene with him. He looks through the window at me, and we're just heavy at it. And I asked the young man, could you just slide your hand up under my hip? Hip. <laughs> <laughs> under my ass, uh, hip. <clears throat> and he was, he got all worried about his girlfriend. I said, I'm 82 years old. <laughs> 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 all right. <laughs> Did you get his number? No, damn fool. <laughs> All right, we're going to take some questions now. Anybody have a question for Cloris? So when I was growing up and watching the Mary Tyler Moore show, I thought you were the most like glamorous goddess, the way you would burst into the room and you had the best hair on television. And like you and Cher were like the, the, the two sexiest women on TV. And then as I got older and I saw like more of your work, like the last picture show and stuff, I realized that you did a lot of like character parts. And so I was just curious about how, like, as you moved through, through your career, how you negotiated the whole aspect of like needing to rely on your looks or not to rely on your looks, since you know you could go in either direction. You could be a character actress or this super hot foxy woman. Is he on camera? <laughs> Is he? Well, make him be on camera. <laughs> Look at that pretty shirt he's wearing and everything. <laughs> there. And also starting out as like a, you know, um, a method actress and, you know, being very serious about being an actress. Are how you an you actor? Would, yeah. Of course. And how you would negotiate that as you, you know, move through your professional life. Back over to me. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, uh, having, 
having had dancing lessons from 7 to 15, and I discovered boys and forget it, <laughs> I, I uh, got to experience the different parts of myself. My arms and my stomach and my back and my neck and my feet and my legs, all of it. So I had fun on uh, Mary Tyler Moore entering the room, you know, hi, hi. And also I learned that uh, there's going to be a commercial in the next minute, so you better hurry up. So hi, hi. I always came in as if, quick, I'm, we're going to go to a commercial. Uh, but, but having learned, felt all of that as uh, dancing, I think I, I learned that there are different parts of me and I can uh, amplify certain parts and cover up other parts depending. If I were to be a witch, I, you'd have the camera this way. If I'm going to be a princess, I'll be this way. Because my nose is just a little bit off, isn't it? A little bit, tiny bit. <laughs> and uh, I noticed when I was little that I have a long neck and a long back, long waisted. So, and I look taller on television. People always say, oh, I thought you were tall. I'm not. I I'm, have these little short legs. So sometimes, if I want to look short, which I did once, I, I make my neck shorter. And I look inches shorter. Um, or I'll wear high heels or flats, depending. Uh, your hair can be anything. Uh, so I, I think by amplifying certain parts, it helps. And it also, you don't have all of yourself showing all the time. You have that part which tells about the character. Or your hands, you know, how how you use them, how they look. You have nails. I did something for Disney. Uh, the North Avenue. North, North Avenue. North Avenue. Avenue yeah, well, that was my idea. And they did it for me. They made long nails and, and, the, and eyelashes. And I go, oh, at some point, and, the, and they all come off. They're all cut short. And my eyelash goes down to here. And yeah, that was fun. You just saw Susan Boyle on Britain Has Talent? Yes. What would you... Uh, What's your advice to her? <laughs> oh, they, <laughs> well, I said, um, loosen your bra and, <laughs> and put on some Ugg shoes, like <laughs> I'm, the kind I'm wearing, see? Comfortable. Any other questions? I have a lot more answers, so ask me some questions. Cameraman, sir, what's your name? The A. The A? So you've worked. Stand up straight, you're on camera. <laughs> you've worked with, uh, I mean, you're one of my uh, my comedic idols, and then you've what also idol? worked with. I'm one of your what? Comedic idols. Oh, comedic. You've also worked with Catherine Hepburn, in As You Like It, and I was wondering what was it like to be on stage with some of the people in that cast, because that was a pretty well-known production that had a lot of interesting people in it. She wasn't an ordinary person. She was. You didn't ever hang out. You could. I mean, one time we were backstage, we had a spitting contest. just sit there and spit 12 feet, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> she always spit the farthest. And one time I said, what, did you ever have nicknames when you were little, things you called yourself? For instance, I was uh, Judy Gardner or somebody white and somebody, I had all these little names I thought were pretty. Why was I named Horace Leachman? And she said, hell no. She said, I just put on an old dirty t-shirt and cut up my hair and call myself Jim. <laughs> she did, too. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, sit down then, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm coming. I'm, I'm the, uh, um, first off, I just. Wait, come so she can, oh, okay. in front of you. yeah. Come on up here. I don't even here. know what it looks like. You can Stand right up, up here. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, just Wait, for. Stand against there so he can, yeah. <laughs> That's good. I'm going to help you. Okay. Here. Put your back against that. Okay. 
Yeah, what do you want to add? <laughs> All right. First off, I just want to say, like, this is truly just an amazing experience oh, for me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I've been, you know, acting. Um, I, unfortunately, didn't have, like, the supportive mom like you were sharing. So it just is, you know, I've had to, like, tread on a bit. You're not on her, are oh, you? God. You're on Georgie. Are you being... Are you being responsible or just a <laughs> put it just a minute, folks? Don't move. I didn't touch a thing. I okay. was so on her. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Anyways, you just want to say like how amazing this is. I've I've you know been acting for a long time. Talk into the mic. I've been acting for a long time, as you can tell, because I, I need to get all these directions. Um and anyways they just it's been cool. I just, you know, I just feel so much more inspired just like being in your presence and whatnot. So, but the question What's I want to... What's going to happen from being here today? Um, I'm just going to rock on, like, no... What? <laughs> how, how, what are you going to do differently? Um, I think I'm just going to have more confidence and, um, uh, and not as much doubt of, like, what I can do because it just seems like you're just being you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The more you're you, the I more know. valuable you are. I know. This is just so beautiful. I mean, this moment with you. Um, and so I thought that, you know, um, with your, you having the same name as your, um, as your mom, right? Is mm -hmm. that what, do you think that had any impact? Like, you had to be a little bit different? Well, than, I was Baby Torty for many years. Oh, Baby Torty. <laughs> baby Torty. She was Mama Torty. Yes. <laughs> then Mama Torty and Little Torty, and then Big Torty and Little Torty. Okay. For years. Or uh, Sis was my other name of my two little sisters. I was Sis. Mom, right. what? he's shooting me. No, he isn't. I saw. It. He's no, not. Look. Well, look. Well, but you, he. That's that camera. I know. <laughs> but I'm feeling, you know. Um, so you, so you don't think that it had anything to do with, you know? Did you like having sharing their name with your mom? I didn't think about it. Oh, you didn't. Called her mama all my life. Yeah. She was darling, and I loved her very much. And is there just they wanted to pass on the name, and that's why? I guess. I don't know why they named me that, but people have trouble naming kids. Yes. Sharon, <laughs> Susan, Emily. I didn't have a name right. for six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Marlon Brando and his grandmother, uh, Mabel Albertson, who was Darren's mother uh, on Bewitched, the little blonde woman who's always had a headache. And she was my mother-in-law, his grandmother. She named Georgie Junior because he was my third son. You usually name the first one Junior. Right. Well, he'd already picked out Adam. And then Brian was a reject name for Adam, so we made it with a Y because he was seven months old. And Georgie, poor little thing, so Marlon and, and Mabel named him Junior, George okay. Junior. I'm going to come back over All here. All right, well, thank you very much. But you know what I think? Okay. It's like you're in good hands with Allstate. You be Allstate. <laughs> <laughs> really, I'm serious. All right. You be Allstate. You know, okay. when you walk in somewhere, I'm who you're looking for, not are you looking for me? Right. I'm coming to look about a park. Look for, no, you're coming. Whatever you need, I'm it. All right. All state. That's right. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one question. Um, is the Phyllis TV show available on DVD? And Do you want to stand up, please? I want to see oh, your yeah. black shirt with a rabbit head on yes, it. Yes, my Playboy shirt. Um, I, I just wanted to know. Say I wasn't. Again, what? Is the Phyllis show. Available on DVD, or will it? Are there any plans for it, it to be on DVD? It's me. I'm not in charge of those things. I wish it would be out. Okay. A lot of people ask for it, and we hope that they will release it. Uh, I think Rhoda just came out. I'm not yeah, it's just so the Rhoda season one came out. So well, I was she just wondering if they're planning. always comes out ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> that was my question, anyway. So we'll be looking out for it. We should all push for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. everybody call in and ask. Hello. I was on TV recently, so I actually caught an episode. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. You two obviously enjoy playing off of one another. And I'm <laughs> curious whether this is an extension of a childhood where you also, you know, in the home, you enjoyed playing off each other, or is this something that came up later? Georgie's one of the funniest men I've ever known, he and his father. The three of us get to laughing till we're just sick. I mean, it hurts so much. You just beg for mercy. Don't we, George? Yeah, we laugh. <laughs> We have a great time. It is an extension. Uh, 
but I think <coughs> I've been managing her for about a year and a half now. We've been very close traveling the world and doing all these events together, so it has uh, brought us physically closer together, all, you know, sharing the time every day and experiencing everything, so uh, I have to torture her as much as I can. <laughs> No. We Watch what he does with his arm. George, don't let me. <laughs> I'm driving 80 miles an hour on the freeway, and she's doing this, pulling my hair. Well, that's only after you do something. <laughs> <laughs> and I do that. Yeah. And then I look back, and there's a cop. <laughs> Anybody else? How? <laughs> I have my fingers back. Look where your hand is. I it's on my side. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank you very much.